Thank you so much. It was really an honor to be here. And thank you for that lovely introduction. I hope I can make this good. <laughs> In his treatise on the Holy Trinity, St. Augustine of Hippo referred to visual portraits of Jesus, along with Paul and Peter and the Virgin Mary. And he commented that when we read something or uh, uh, when we read about something or someone who exists but we have not seen, um, we inevitably make images of them in our minds. He says, whether or not these images bear any resemblance to reality has little bearing on our understanding and even less on our faith. Yet, because we may believe things we cannot see, we take care not to fabricate images that do not exist or to love or place hope in those fabrications. Something that is unseen can be believed, as in the case of God, who cannot be seen. Yet, he goes on, images are not necessarily harmful, so long as our faith is rightly directed to their source or model, and not to our constructed image. He offers an example. And this is really where I want to have us think. The physical face of the Lord, he says, is pictured with infinite variety by countless imaginations, though whatever it was like, he certainly had one. <laughs> Nor as regards the faith we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is it in the least relevant to our salvation what our imaginations picture him like which is probably quite different from the reality. What does matter is that we think of him as a man, for we have embedded in us, as it were, the standard notion of the nature of a man. Now, he goes on to say that it would be a miracle if one of the many diverse representations we humans make in our imaginations were actually accurate. We cannot discern a true image of Christ partly because we have no way of verifying such a thing. Moreover, Augustine claims that no external image can be truthful insofar as any image is transitory and unstable. We need, he would say, to attain truth through faith rather than through appearances. Now, Augustine's analysis, I think, both acknowledges the reality of the variations and justifies them in a way to an audience that he assumes is familiar with many of the examples he cites. The work of art, the way I read this anyway, the work of art is valid not because it is a faithful copy of an established portrait tradition, since he would say that none exists, but rather it's valid because of the piety of the artist and because its simple existence confirms that Jesus human was a human and incarnate. Because imagination fills in what cannot be known, each of us will have our own idea of how Jesus looked. The important thing is to understand that he actually did have an image, a face, and a body like ours. Now, it's a simple fact that the New Testament does not provide a physical description of Jesus. So then, one could say, why do we have so many portraits that seem to reflect such a familiar conventional type? Long, wavy hair, a full beard, penetrating eyes. This one, you'll probably all know this one. <laughs> why are these examples so instantly recognizable to us? And might we question them? Are they helpful, are they harmful, or are they just traditional? Now, I opened this lecture with an image of Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. Some of you probably know about this one. Christie's Auction House sold this in 2017 for more than $450 million. It holds the record for the most expensive painting ever sold. The buyer, perhaps an agent for Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, a good Christian, <laughs> evidently said or somehow led them to believe that it was to be transferred to Abu Dhabi 
uh, to the Louvre Public, the uh, Abu Dhabi Louvre Museum, and it would go on display. It has since disappeared. Rumor has it the prince decided to keep it for himself, no doubt in a vault somewhere where no one can see it. <laughs> now, more than 20 years ago, in the final run-up to the turn of the millennium, we had, I think, a near explosion of general public interest in portraits of Christ and the history of Christ's representation in visual art. Four events in particular serve as examples, both of, to the new attention to this matter and also as contributions to, in themselves to generating even more attention. One was an exhibit in London's National Gallery, and it was titled The Image of Christ. And it was an all-out blockbuster to the astonishment even of the show's curator, then museum director, Neil McGregor. Actually, I found out that from McGregor himself that he had not any idea what to do for an exhibit once. They somehow lost something, and he just threw this together and thought no one would come. <laughs> but this exhibit brought crowds from around the world and an avalanche of letters and monetary contributions to the museum. Yay! <laughs> Theologians and sociologists alike attempted to analyze this amazing positive response in a country long assumed to have lost any interest in traditional religion. In 2011 then, the Philadelphia Museum of Art mounted an exhibit called The Face of Jesus, which focused mainly on Rembrandt, Rembrandt's seven portraits of Christ made between 1643 and 1655. Another a PBS special aired around Christmas 2000 entitled The Face, Jesus in Art. That's actually a picture of the uh, DVD, which you can get. <laughs> Popular and scholarly presses then got into the act, including Joan Taylor's What Did Jesus Look Like? In 2018, Michelle Bacci's The Many Faces of Christ in 2014, and I think I've blurbed all of these books. This one is, and admittedly, my own book, which I sort of have to say I didn't expect to be trendy, uh, the uh, Face to Face, the Image of Christ in, in Early Christianity. But one, to me, one of the most unusual was a contest staged by the National Catholic Reporter, Jesus at 2000. The winner, Janet McKenzie, Jesus of the People, uh, was both praised and panned as people weighed in with their comments to the journal. This Jesus did not appear to be clearly male, of any obvious ethnicity, and surrounded by symbols that seemed to suggest some kind of religious syncretism. Well, you can see a yin yang here, or a feather perhaps. Maybe it's Native American, maybe this is African, maybe she's woman, maybe he's male. Um, she's ahead of her time. Clearly, the question of how Jesus has been or should be depicted in art is one that interests people. Finally, a few months ago, I had, I hope he's not here, I had a rather tense email exchange with a reporter, I won't name, who, asked, who wrote to ask me why images of Jesus are always light-skinned, blonde, and blue-eyed. I responded in an email exchange, that while, yes, one could find many such images, there are plenty of others, perhaps even a majority, that don't show him this way at all. He wasn't happy about that. I quickly sensed that my answer was unacceptable or that I had missed his point. I assumed, incorrectly as it turned out, that my questioner believed, that I, this was my assumption, that he believed a first century Palestinian man, Jesus, should look something somehow Middle Eastern and not European. But gradually, I realized that my interrogator had something else and completely different in mind, the book, the figure in the book of Revelation, the one we might call the Ancient of Days, one whose hair is white as wool with eyes of, like flames of fire and feet like burnished bronze. And there's an icon of that. Um, it's also an image in Daniel, the book of Daniel 7 an ancient one with hair like pure wool, it says. It dawned on me that the reporter was actually upset that the portrait of Jesus seemed not to follow this pattern that I think he believed should look African. 
Now, perhaps I should have pointed them to Janet McKenzie's Jesus of the People for, to ponder, but I didn't. The fact is, though, that we don't know what Jesus looked like in his earthly life. We have no descriptions from life in scripture and only vaguely confusing ones in various non-canonical gospels like the Acts of John and the Acts of Peter, which portray Jesus in changeable ways, sometimes as a boy, sometimes as a man, and sometimes even as an old woman. Although someone might point to the description of the suffering servant in Isaiah 43, who has no form or majesty, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, or by contrast, the beautiful savior of Psalm 45, the most handsome of men, it's not obvious that these texts, at least to us, necessarily refer to the historical Jesus. Moreover, the Gospels imply that the risen Jesus was unrecognizable to many of his followers, like those on the road to Emmaus until he broke bread with them, or Mary Magdalene, who mistook him for the gardener, and it was only when he spoke to her that she realized who he was. The transfiguration event is another example in which Jesus' physical appearance seems to change. Each of these instances should I think, suggests that we should not be too sure that we can achieve anything like a realistic portrait of Christ in his life on earth or after, especially after his resurrection and ascension. So trying to describe the physical appearance of the human Jesus must appear, to my mind, like trying to figure out, based on some kind of science or method, exactly what he said or didn't say, and then try to connect, correct those gospels to our very learned conclusions. But the fact that we have four different presentations of the Jesus in the New Testament contravenes our efforts, and maybe for a very good reason. We are not supposed to understand in such a simplistic manner. Nevertheless, an effort similar to writing such a gospel harmony or producing the accurate portrait of a historical Jesus was undertaken around the same time in 1999, maybe many of you know this, by Popular Mechanics magazine. <laughs> this is a forensic artist, like a courtroom artist, hypothetical reconstruction of Jesus' physical appearance using the skull of a Palestinian male, someone produced, uh, dated probably to the first century. Although the comparison is hardly fair and really unjust, the effort has something in common with Rembrandt's decision to use a young Jewish man as his model. Now, these efforts to be scripturally or historically authentic are almost, not in the case of Rembrandt, but maybe in the case of popular mechanics, almost comically clumsy. Can we presume that all first century Palestinian men looked alike? <laughs> or that all Dutch Jews did or still do look like Jesus? And aren't all these artistic efforts inescapably influenced by the artist's cultural context or the intended audience or personal whim? These possibilities are obvious to me, though I often encounter the idea that visual artists should strive to depict the authentic Jesus, but without really saying what they mean or how someone could even go about that. And that raises another kind of important question, uh, one I run into all the time. Can we or should we even make pictorial depictions of Jesus at all? What Augustine thought it could be done, though with some qualifications, and only relatively. According to other early Christian writers, it would be impossible, heretical, or even basically blasphemous. One of the most commonly cited treatments of this problem comes from a letter purported to be from the fourth century bishop and historian Eusebius of Caesarea. He was writing to the emperor Constantine's daughter, Constantia. I actually am not sure about the legitimacy of this letter, but I'm alone almost these days in this thinking. But according to this document, the princess had written to him requesting a portrait of Jesus for her personal devotional use. His reply expresses outrage and summarizes the nub of the problem as he sees it. And here it is, quote, 
What sort of image of Christ are you seeking? Is it the true and unalterable one which bears his essential characteristics? Or the one he took up for our sakes when he assumed the form of a servant? Granted, he has two forms. Even I do not think your request has to do, though, with his divine form. Surely then you are seeking his image as a servant, that of the flesh which he put on for our sake. But that too, we have been taught, was mingled with the glory of his divinity so that the mortal part was swallowed up by this life. Oh, okay, end quote. A less famous story concerns a from life portrait of Jesus. The second century church father Irenaeus complained that certain corporations possessed images of philosophers, including one of Christ made by none other than Pontius Pilate. He had, had to do something while Jesus was sitting on the cold stone. I can see the picture. They treated these portraits the way that pagans, he, he says, customarily venerated idols with garlands and lit candles. Irenaeus clearly believed that practice, if not the portraits themselves, were the products of a Gnostic sect. No, so therefore, in his mind, um, un un not orthodox. A different fourth century letter is attributed to Epiphanius, the heresy-fighting bishop of Salamis, writing to the emperor Theodosius toward the end of the uh, century. Although only found among the records of ninth century iconoclasts and read out by the critics of images, the letter opens by denying that any ancient Christian father could have tolerated a painted image of Christ either for display in a church or in a private home. Sounds like a good Calvinist argument, perhaps. The rest of his text provides some other very useful information, however, that those, he says, who do such things, presumably then somebody's doing it, they lie by representing the Savior with long hair. And they do that by conjecture that he was a Nazarene, and Nazarenes had long hair. Epiphanius notes, of course, that Jesus was um, uh, about this assumption that Jesus was a Nazarene and says he was not because Nazarenes don't drink wine and Jesus did. So he couldn't have been that. So he wouldn't have long hair. He then asserts that artists who make such pictures invent physical types according to their whims and that simple logic contradicts them. How could he have had long hair, he asks, when all his disciples had short hair? How does he know this? I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, the problem here is that this would have made Jesus look different from his disciples, and then there wouldn't have been no need to ask Judas to give him with a kiss to identify him. <laughs> the Pharisees, he says, could have saved their money. <laughs> Irenaeus's mention, Irenaeus's mention back there at the Carpocratians, and Epiphanius' description, however, of this long-haired Jesus, parallel another interesting letter one supposedly from Pontius Pilate's predecessor as governor of Judea, this man never existed, but this is the tradition, Publius Lentulus to the Roman people in the Senate, Lent Lentulus's letter to the Roman people in the Senate. The oldest version of this letter comes from a 15th century manuscript and is included with the life of Christ by Ludolf the Carthusian and also found in an introduction to the works of Saint Anselm. In this letter, and this is a diptych which shows it, Lentulus pictures Jesus as, quote, somewhat tall in stature with a comely appearance, his hair the color of an unripe hazelnut, and smoothed down to his ears, and then somewhat curled, darker and shinier, waving around his shoulders and curly. Now this is supposed to be the first century Publius Lentulus. It was parted in the center after the pattern of the Nazarenes. <laughs> His brow was smoothed and unwrinkled, his complexion ruddy, and his expression cheerful. He had an abundant, but not particularly long brown beard that was divided at his chin. His eyes were blue, blue, I'm sorry, blue gray, clear and quick. Finally, the description concludes, he is the most beautiful among human beings, in a reference to Psalm 45. Now, as Augustine says, Jesus was human and therefore must have had a face and a physique that people could see. His humanity in a very real sense confirms that it is acceptable to make images of him, however imperfectly. 
By, for reason of the incarnation alone, then, we must imagine Christ in human form, and therefore we must be able to make images of him in human form. And this is something that actually goes on through the history of the iconoclastic controversy and reaffirmed by John of Damascus in the ninth century. What's more, it was necessary that Christ become human in order that humans could see him. And I'm thinking about the lecture this morning. It's really going to be some nice, I hope, some nice uh, um, echoes here. Irenaeus says in his um, Treatise Against Heresies, a very familiar text to many of us, those who see God receive life, and for this reason, the one who is beyond comprehension and boundless and invisible rendered himself visible and within the capability of those who believe so that he might visit, vivify those who behold him through faith. But even more, and even more maybe an echo of the morning's lectures, Athanasius of Alexandria, who insists that God took on a corporeal appearance, a mortal body, so that humans might witness to his person and his deeds. Quote, he made himself visible enough so by what he did abiding in it and doing such works and showing such signs as to make him known no longer only as human, but also as God, the divine word. Yet while theologians may insist on Christ's human presence, they do, artists <laughs> still have to make decisions about how to depict him. Was he tall or short, beautiful or ugly, broad-chested, square-jawed, round-faced, long-haired, long beard? How does anybody know? Augustine apparently was unaware of any valid descriptions or authorized from life portraits that would have provided a true likeness. And there are, to be fair, certain images that some claim to, be have, some claim to have been made from life. The most famous at this, these is the so-called Mendelian of King Ebgar, obtained, as the tradition says, by the first century king of Edessa, who sent out his servant to ask Jesus to come and heal him. Rather than coming himself, the servant found Jesus. Jesus was a little busy about then. Jesus says, oh, you know, I can't make it. I'll send somebody later. But obliges the servant with an image of his face imprinted on a cloth that he used as a towel. There's different versions of this story, um, but this is very much the standard representation of the cloth. The earliest known version of this story appears to date to the sixth century, so it's difficult to anchor in any historical record. It does, of course, you're probably all thinking, have a parallel in the veil of Veronica. At least the Catholics in the audience would think this. <laughs> and no doubt there are many of us who are also thinking about the Shroud of Turin or other so-called miraculous images that we may or may not choose to believe are in some sense portraits made from life of Christ, whether it's a, a death uh, mask, wrap, um, and there's other stories like this that seem to sort of authorize the image of Christ, as you can see here, with that long chestnut colored brown hair parted in the middle down to his shoulders, pointed beard, sometimes divided into two parts, um, that has a, ruddy, a ruddy complexion and so forth. That's what we seem to get. And, and it may be that these images actually authorize that. They show Jesus' face only, however, and as I said, consistently with this dark hair parted in the middle and a long narrow nose and a small mouth with a drooping mustache and on and on. These miraculous, made without hands portraits were enormously important for Byzantine and Western art and certainly have much in common with our conventional depictions. Like the well-known Christ, we often think of these um, from St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai and beyond. Their influence was so great that viewers often refused to accept other presentations. 
one famous example was one of these actually shown in that uh, British uh, the London uh, National Gallery exhibition that McGregor mounted um, of Caravaggio's uh, Supper at Emmaus. This confounded, when it was first shown, and even still does, the viewing public for its strange presentation to their eyes of a beardless Christ. But the question that merits some consideration is whether these miraculous images were already influenced by something that pre-existed, or if they were the basis for those conventional portraits that most of us find so familiar. Now, I have to tell you, as an early Christian historian of art, or historian of early Christian art, rather, I'm not so old that, but uh, <laughs> artists did not always, or even initially, depict Jesus as bearded. It seems that the earliest depictions of Jesus we have normally show him as a youthful, beardless uh, man with the long curling hair. And here's an example. Um, if I can find the, whoop, I'm still not using this right. Uh, all right. You'll just have to, Jesus is the one with the long hair and the no beard. <laughs> and he's right now, he's, he's uh, multiplying loaves on one side, he's healing the paralytic over here, and you can see the contrast with his shorter haired and sometimes bearded apostles. Um, in this respect, then he does look very different from his apostles, so Epiphanius might have been correct to express concern about why Jesus would need to point him out since his appearance was so distinctive. So far as we can tell from surviving artifacts, actually I have a few more images for you. There's another one. He really had a Tony at this point. Those of us a certain generation know what that means. Okay, I'm going to go back. Okay. With extremely rare exceptions, depictions of Jesus as bearded do not date, predate the late fourth century. And this is maybe the first one. There's one in the ceiling up here. And I can say more about the rest of that, but this is the what I think could be one of the first, if not the first image of Christ as bearded. And it's one of the earliest portraits we have where there's no narrative context. He's, it's just a portrait. Um, and but, nevertheless, from that time on, the bearded type becomes more and more popular until by the Middle Ages, it was essentially the only way that someone could depict him. Still, for the first two centuries of Christian art, Two distinct portrait types and traditions coexist, one with a beardless figure dominating and then only eventually, uh, the, the beardless one eventually disappearing. For a while, we can find both types even sometimes on the same monument. The first is what I call the beautiful savior type. In these, Jesus is presented with a youthful appearance, beardless face, often long curly hair, although not necessarily here, and a graceful, if somewhat sinuous, body and posture. He's really quite elegant here. He normally wears a tunic and pallium, um, not a toga, but it's a kind of ordinary street dress for Roman males of the fourth century. What may be very interesting to the theme of our symposium is that in all of these early images, he also appears in scenes from his earthly life. Here he's healing, teaching, he works wonders, he enters Jerusalem, and so forth. Very few images of his death or resurrection can be dated prior to the fifth or sixth century. I often sort of say to my students, it's like, the creed goes from born of the Virgin Mary to suffered under Pontius Pilate, the art fills in the middle <laughs> and leaves out those two ends. In these compositions, Jesus bears a striking resemblance to the images of the Good Shepherd, which predate any Christian narrative or portrait types. And I do think these are images that are metaphors more than they are portraits of Christ. So this is the shepherd. Apart from the fact that he's never, Jesus has never shown nude, he does appear remarkably similar to other pagan savior gods of the time, sons of Jupiter, 
or semi-divine heroes, particularly those who were believed to work wonders, shepherd souls through the underworld, bring light from darkness, be born in some miraculous way, die and then rise again. Okay. For instance, the physical types of Apollo or Dionysus or Hermes. And this iconographic confusion of Christ with younger gods should not surprise us, really, since Christian writers, beginning with Justin Martyr in the, in the second century, have long recognized the parallels of the Jesus story with the myths of these gods and the possibility of, the, of their conflation and confusion. The same problem arises with respect to those healing gods, human, uh, human magicians, or itinerant wonder workers, like Asclepius. Simon Magus or Apollonius of Tyana. And while for a, for a while this confusion was fostered, according to these writers, by demons for the very purpose of drawing people away from the truth, the attribution of such acts to these junior gods then provides credibility to the claims made for Jesus. And here's a quote from Justin Martyr. We propound nothing different than what you believe about those esteemed sons of Jupiter. But the difference is, he's true. <laughs> now the second type, this is the sort of one type, the second type is quite different. And I call it the bearded judge or teacher type. We see this very, very early, but in only rare examples of teacher, Jesus' is teaching. I think I have another one here. A type that parallels the iconography of ancient philosophers. Uh, so look at that or as ascended and seated on a throne and giving the law to his apostles. And this is, um, this one is an important example. Um, in the center, Jesus is standing outside the columns, as you can see, and he's rising up on stones that show that he's already ascended to heaven. He's got four rivers of paradise coming from the stones that he stands upon. And his apostles are still on earth, but they're receiving the law. And on the left side, Jesus is washing Peter's feet, so it jumps backwards in time. And on the right side, Pilate is washing his hands. And you notice Jesus, in both of those scenes, is beardless, or is in the center he's bearded. Um, OK, so and this one, I'm just giving you this as a kind of the classic first Jesus as enthroned on heaven, on his heavenly throne in a golden robe, in a, a jeweled throne, and not at all like a Roman emperor, I have to, to say, as I come back to it, um, and heavily bearded, surrounded by his disciples in the New Jerusalem. And that's a bigger scene, but I wanted to give you the bearded type. These, I think, should com be compared, not just with the iconography of philosophers, but also the iconography of the senior gods, Jupiter and Neptune, for example. Now, some of these portraits of Jesus as teacher or king will still show him as youthful and beardless. And thus, from the earliest times, we have a mixture of both types, sometimes in similar compositions. Occasionally, they even occur in the same place, as we just saw on that sarcophagus where Jesus was washing feet and Pilate's washing hands. Um, for example, we have two distinct portraits or figures of Jesus in a small building that was the mausoleum of Constantine's daughter, Constantia. And there, you can see both of these types without really doing more than turning your head. You don't even have to move your body. And for a long time, art historians tried to say this one was Moses <laughs> or God the Father because they couldn't coordinate the fact that these two could be so different from each other. But they're both Jesus. I'm sure they're both Jesus. The same thing happens in San Vitale and Ravenna, in which we have this beautiful um, in Jesus sitting on the orb of the world, but looking youthful again and beardless, which is not very far away from this one in the same building done at the same time. We can't date these last images precisely, but we can assume, I think, that they were done by the same workshop of artisans. At least they were seen by people at the same time, fairly quickly, and that the sharp contrast in their appearance did not make either of them unacceptable or even puzzling to the worshipers who gazed at them during liturgical celebrations. But what could these variations mean? 
One possibility is that the deviation or this deviation or differences in iconography presents Jesus as better than all of the pagan gods since he is, in a sense, all of them and even more in one person. He does everything they do. But in, as in Justin Smarter's sense, he does it truly. We offer proof for the sake of the truth in order to draw people away from worshiping idols. One of the reasons for artwork. He is also the ruler of the cosmos, so depicting him as a supreme sovereign king who rules all over, all over the earth makes him even better than human emperors and in fact even better than Jupiter, the king of gods. But another possible explanation is that Jesus' appearance changes through the, the years of his ministry as he matures. Or perhaps his form alters as he enters into his glory at the beginning of his passion. And after he ascends into heaven and is enthroned as Lord and Judge. Or, finally, in his second coming. But a final possibility is that Jesus, trans that Jesus transcends a single appearance for the sake of viewers who may need him to be manifest in different ways, at different times, or in different circumstances of their lives. Now this is articulated in, in several places in early Christian texts, but the, one of the best is comes from Cyril of Jerusalem in the fourth century. The Savior comes in various forms to each person according to need. To those who lack joy, he becomes a vine. To those who wish to enter in, he is a door. For those who must offer prayers, he is a mediating high priest. To those in sin, he becomes a sheep to be sacrificed on their behalf. He becomes all things to all people, remaining in his own nature what he is. For so remaining and, be and possessing the true and unchanging dignity of sonship, as the best of physicians and the caring, most caring of teachers, he adapts himself to our infirmities. And this could be an explanation for the changing visual images of Jesus and why we should continue to have them. Not only should we avoid being foolishly historical or unnecessarily consistent, we must imagine or choose images for Jesus in different places, eras, and situations, and that all of them could be equally correct. Although it may be useful at times to draw upon symbols like a lamb or a gate, we also want to consider the sixth, uh, a canon of the seventh century council, the Council of Trullo, which proclaimed that representations of Christ were to be made only in human form. In sum, Christian art may have consciously depicted Jesus in diverse ways so as to affirm his variety of roles as teacher, healer, miracle worker, judge, lawgiver, enthroned, lord, and so forth. The iconography in, the, this iconographic inconsistency undermines idolatry. <laughs> it really does. By resisting a single cult image while affirming his incarnation and depicting him in human form. The history of Christian art reveals important pastoral as well as theological motivations then insofar as no single image of Jesus is authentic. Jesus, or historical, Jesus is baby, teacher, healing, healer, innocent victim. Our hymns proclaim him beautiful savior, judge eternal, enthroned in splendor, and so forth. An enormous variety of representations have emerged from 2,000 years of Christian imagination. And almost every one of these diverse images contains some distinguishing element that almost mystically proclaims and identifies it as a portrait of Christ. One last caveat. This does not mean that anything, all visual images, are equally good or valid. Some may rightly be called heretical, blasphemous, or even simply tasteless. Oh, there's the lamb on the throne. I want to give that one to you really fast. <laughs> Don't have a Similarly, I believe it is heretical to insist, though, that only one portrait of Jesus is true. Why not then represent Jesus as African or Native American or male or female or Asian? The only important thing is that he became incarnate as a human being with the face and body in some fashion like ours. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation to begin the afternoon. 
I'm immediately struck as people are beginning to come to uh, the microphone for question and answer. I'm immediately struck by just how rich a presentation that is, thinking with the early church about the faces of Christ with deep theological and pastoral resonance, I think. Um, really quite a lot to think about here, and I'm sure there'll be other questions coming soon, but let me get us started off and ask you about this idea of beauty and ugliness, mm -hmm. which it comes up in passing and really struck me because I can't help but think as I reflect on the beauty of Christ, um, is, is there much reflection in the early church in particular about that beauty primarily as outward or is it inward? Um, so much of my thinking about beauty and people is sort of sorted out in that way. And I wonder if you can uh, comment on that at all, if there's any reflection going on in that way. Um, for, uh, historically, I think we do see Jesus initially, uh, and I just have to say, what we ha there's so many caveats around this. What we have, early Christian art, we don't have anything from the first or even the second century, so we're looking at third and fourth. We have very little remaining to us from places other than around Rome, which is where we get most everything. So what we don't know is what we don't have, you know, so it's hard to sort of say something categorically. I think initially the idea was that he should look different and we should recognize him immediately because of his beauty. Um, but that doesn't hold through the history of Christian art as um, often people, you know, in, especially in the Middle Ages, were not fearful about making Jesus um, incredibly suffering, uh, you know, in, a, in that sense, um, drawing out of compassion and, our, and, and showing Jesus in, with pathos, not just as reigning or not just as lordly even with beard and so forth. So I think the question of beauty is a very complicated one and, um, and it would be much, we could probably spend an hour talking about that, but I, I think that the idea of the suffering and dead Christ, which is not at all beautiful in some outward way, becomes incredibly beautiful, especially by the Middle Ages, and people find it that. Thank you. Okay, we have open mics, so I welcome you to bring your questions forward. Hi, Dr. Jensen, uh, great paper. Uh, Kent Eilers, quick question. Uh, I've been sitting with the work of the, of the Cranachs, uh, the younger and the older, and uh, was uh, spending some time with my students the other day with Lucas Cranach, the Younger's, the, the Weimar altarpiece, the, the center depiction of Christ's crucifixion and the blood sort of goes the wrong way onto his father, et, et cetera. Um, and so you, like the way that Jesus gets depicted for the Reformation cause, um, I wonder just if you could comment on that. Do we see anything of that in early Christian depictions of Christ where the, the, the nature of his depiction is really shaped toward saying something to the viewer of Christ's sort of placement with a cause or with a person. Does that make sense? I think so. I, maybe, maybe what I'm thinking I can get at with this is often the argument that, especially that enthroned Jesus, mm. um, is actually trying to align Jesus with the emperor. Would that be close to what you're thinking about? And I really resist that. Um, Jesus is not shown as an emperor. Um, emperors at that time did not have beards. <laughs> they were clean shaven and they had fairly, um, they could have very fancy dress, but they sat in fairly simple ivory chairs. So what we're showing, I think, and maybe this could be interesting to think about with Cranach, I haven't thought about it with Cranach that way, but is that um, this is an uh, effort to show Jesus as ruler it could almost be undermining the imperial authority. So yeah. I kind of run against the idea that Jesus has been turned into an emperor. <laughs> he is, but he's not an earthly emperor. Yeah, um, I, can't, I, mean, I wonder about that too with some of the ways that even the New Testament authors, right, will talk mm -hmm. about Jesus as Lord and the way that Peter will Absolutely. invert the expected it, order in his letter with the emperor. And is there some of that going on with the art as well? Yeah, I think so. I totally okay. think so. Thank and you so, so much. Yeah. I step back from that. And for a long time, art historians are really into the, well, this is a whole book about this, but into the imperial mystique and trying to make Christian art sort of captive to the political desires of the emperor. And I don't think it works. Mm. I don't think it works. Mm. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, there's lots of popular notions that Jesus was a carpenter, and everyone knows that. Um, I didn't see any pictures of him with a hammer. What, what's your take um, on that? Uh, 
really common and, and, and popular notion. People may not know anything about fine art, but th th that seems to be a, a, an enduring image. Actually, it's pretty much quite late. <laughs> um, so I'm, 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 this coming week, I've been teaching a whole class in the Virgin Mary in art this semester, and this coming week my focus is on the Holy Family um, because we're doing the Reformation and the Virgin Mary, which is going to blow some minds of my Catholic students. <laughs> Just like when I taught this course to Vanderbilt Divinity students, I kind of blew their minds in a different direction. But anyway, um, I think um, the idea that um, that we could show Jesus in his earthly life, you know, with the crowd, with the, the lathe and the plane and his father and working with his father and the tools and um, really comes up in a desire to kind of make this domestic happiness on both Catholic and Protestant sides, but in sort of different ways um, to kind of have us identify more with him. And that might get us at the idea of the human Jesus. For a long time, the, I often say the, pr the prime image of Jesus through the Middle Ages is still going to be the crucifixion. But that's cha that changes a lot. It doesn't even start until the 6th century, and we don't have a suffering Jesus until almost the 12th and 13th centuries. So there's a lot to say about all that, but I think the idea of Jesus, I, I love the idea of Jesus, um, you know, often, often sitting next to his mother and he's, you know, he's helping her with her, you know, knitting or something and, you know, he's, um, or he's reading to her while she's working. These are often even quite late, um, nothing that we would see before the 17th century. Hi, thank you. Um, several of the representations of Christ you presented were found in early churches. Mm -hmm. but majority of churches I've attended have no visual representation of Christ in them. What do you think the church has lost by losing those representations? Um, it is changing, of course. Um, people who worry about idolatry, and I think that's a huge topic, um, and it's something I touched on a little bit of how I think if we can understand that Jesus can be depicted in a myriad of ways, and they're all be true, I think we also have an argument against idolatry. <laughs> um, but I think the fear was of, it's a late medieval fear of what happened with people mistaking the object for something of its, in itself as worthy of adoration. Um, and we can talk about whether that really happened and to what extent it happened, but um, what we lost, we lost the visual. You know, we lost so much, and, and in fact, I have to compliment the people who are stay with it, the artists who continue to commit themselves to doing artwork for the church, are, have, they have a very hard task, um, and we need them. <laughs> I give a shout out to our artist. <laughs> You just commented a moment ago about crucifixes, and that was my question, because that's the images of Christ that I see most often. I was just traveling in Italy and saw crucifixes everywhere, and then also the image of Mary with the corpse of Jesus in her lap. Mm -hmm. So could you comment on when those arose and what their place is in this whole picture? Um, often I say that the, the most, when, especially an audience of you know, people who do have a lot of art in their churches, I'll say the thing that you immediately think of is the crucifix, um, and the second thing you might think of is the Madonna with the child, maybe the more like the baby, Madonna and child. And those are really not, um, we don't really have those until the sixth century. Um, and there's a lot more to say about that and the movement from a narrative art to a more iconic art. Um, and that is itself is a very complicated uh, shift, I think. But, I, but it's, it, that's sort of where I said we don't have the middle of, you know, we don't have the creed, we have the middle <laughs> in the visual art, at, at least at first. Um, and I think that part of it, um, and the crucifix changes a lot too. I mean, initially, Jesus is alive and eyes are open and he's raining from the cross and he's vigorous. And then he starts to suffer and his body begins to sag and his eyes begin to close and then you start to have the Mary taking the body off the cross and Mary swooning and all of this. It's an attempt to be effective, to affect your emotions and to get you engaged with that story. Um, and it really begins 
I think most strongly I associate it with the, with the mendicant orders, the Franciscans in particular, who want us to have an emotional response to the story and to the figure, not an intellectual one so much. And it's not didactic anymore, it's devotional. Um, and it's very effective. But it doesn't happen until later. If I can just ask one more question, or at least reflect with you for a moment, uh, I couldn't help but think of uh, Shusaku Endo's silence mm -hmm. as you were speaking about these images. And I don't know if you're familiar with oh, yeah. the novel or the film, but it strikes me that there's something of that combination of theology and piety that is so present there, as in the novel, there is this weight, weighty question about whether one can trample on the face of Christ. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I'm struck by the ways that in recent cinema then, the face of Christ becomes such a, a prominent sort of feature of this film and sort of asks, Scorsese asks, mm -hmm. for audience to think about the meaning of the face of Christ. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I, I realize I'm throwing that from completely left field here, but. Hmm. Um, I, I will jump to a different film, because one of the most striking images I think of when you said film was in the film of Gods and Men. When the monk who is in Africa comes up to the image of the crucifix and places himself on it, and it's right before they're going to be arrested and taken off and beheaded. And it's the identification of the self with that image. It's a very powerful image for me, and I don't know if it gets at what you're looking for, but I'm thinking about what it means to desecrate an image and what it means to identify with one. Um, and it might get us to thinking about the power of images themselves as changing us as we live with them and um, how we couldn't imagine living without your corpus <laughs> once we have it. It becomes part of our experience and our world. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of the question and answer for this paper, but let's say a word of thanks, please. Thank